Content warning. This video contains news articles that detail violence against women. This is going to be a hard episode to watch for many people, and I'm going to be honest. I've cried more than a few times during the making of this. The topic of the murder of women touched our YouTube community when Heather, Ivy of the Skeptic Feminist, was allegedly murdered by her intimate partner. The number of women who are murdered by men they either know or are members of their family is gut-wrenching. The number of women shot to death by their intimate partners in the United States is staggering. And the number of trans women of color who have been murdered in the U.S. since January should alarm us all. Hello there, it's Christy, and welcome to another episode of This Week in Stupid Misogynists. Given that this week's articles focus on violence and death, I'm going to skip the comments section this week and double up on it for next week's episode. When I started this series, I knew there were going to be weeks when the topics would focus on the darkest part of what human beings are capable of doing to each other. Some anti-feminists try to trivialize third-wave feminism by painting third-wave feminists as overly privileged cry-bullies who only care about manspreading and manterrupting. The fact is that feminists around the world are working in many ways to stop domestic violence and to prevent men from murdering the women they are supposed to love. There is a lot of work to do and a long way to go for women all over the world, including women in the West. This episode is more proof that women in the West have not achieved equality, especially if those women come from certain families, come from a particular ethnic background, or are trans. This story comes from the British newspaper, The Independent. Honor killing term must not be banned, says woman raped on wedding day. A survivor of forced marriage who suffered years of abuse at the hands of her extended family has criticized calls by a conservative MP to ban the term honor in describing certain types of violent crime. Miriam says removing the label would invalidate the suffering she and others have endured in the name of protecting their family's honor and would disempower both victims and survivors. Outlining a proposed bill in Parliament on Tuesday, MP Nusrat Ghani said the phrase honor killings should be banned from all official documents because it assumes violence is culturally sensitive. The Wielden MP said the term fueled political correctness and, quote, intimidates the agencies of the states in pursuing and prosecuting those violent crimes, unquote. Now Miriam, who did not wish to give her surname for fear of reprisals, has decided to speak out about the importance of acknowledging the role honor plays in these complex crimes. She told The Independent, Honor is a powerful word, and to remove that would be to ignore the abuse I have suffered and the recognition that it was rooted in terms of shame and dishonor. It is not about religion or culture. It is about controlling children, and especially girls and women, who grow up with the constant threat of bringing shame on the family." Unquote. Miriam, who is now in her 30s, was warned never to speak to boys or even look at them, but when she was 16, she was taken to Pakistan and later raped on her wedding night after being forced to marry her 23-year-old cousin. She said there was huge pressure from multiple perpetrators colluding against her. Miriam went on to endure an extremely violent marriage and her daughters were in turn harassed and controlled. She said, my husband and his family controlled every aspect of my life. His mother even chose my clothes despite living abroad. When I had my children, they said I'd brought shame on the family for not producing a son. The final straw came when her husband beat her and threatened her with a knife when she was pregnant. He was convicted and sent to prison, but was released three months later. It was another four years until she and her daughters were able to escape the family. She said, I suffered domestic abuse and honor-based abuse, but they were not the same thing. Professionals need to understand the different motivations and risks involved because these people will kill their own sons and daughters in the name of honor. To follow up on that article, I want to show how little is being done in the UK to protect these women. Now, some police services are taking it seriously and doing a good job, but more can be done to stop and prevent this sort of violence. 
Honor-based violence reports to police reveal only minority of alleged crimes result in charge. It has been nearly a year since an investigation by Her Majesty's Inspectorate of Constabulary found that just three of the nation's 43 police forces were properly prepared to protect and support victims of honor-based violence effectively. Yet nearly 12 months after the report was published, there are still concerns that forces are not doing enough to tackle the problem. Professor Hester was the principal investigator of a research project undertaken for HMIC regarding victims' experiences with the police when reporting honor-based crime. She tells HuffPost UK that there is a much lower charge rate for honor-based crimes because victims fear what will happen to them in the community. Quote, If the victims are not clear that they really will be safe, then why should they go through with it? What we found was that the first time the victims contacted the police wasn't really that bad, but after that it really goes downhill. You don't end up with them staying in the system. While the Crown Prosecution Services says that its own data shows that in 2015-16 to the volumes of forced marriage referrals, cases charged and prosecuted were the highest volume ever recorded, experts are pessimistic about the agency's self-proclaimed success rate. Professor Hester says the CPS's figures do not reflect the dropout rate which occurs from the moment an alleged crime is reported to when the police and CPS get involved. Quote, the statistics aren't actually showing what is happening from report through to conviction. That's why I argue there has been a decrease from reports to conviction rates if you look at it all the way through. Continuing on this theme of honor killings, we're now going to look at what's happening in Canada. Honor killings on the rise in Canada. Most prevalent in the Muslim world, it's a dangerous phenomenon many parents here can't even begin to comprehend. The killing of one's own child, usually a daughter, because her behavior is believed to have brought shame to the family. It is the fate of some rape victims, as well as women accused of infidelity or premarital sex in countries such as Pakistan. But in the West, it's increasingly popping up in courtrooms as first-generation Muslims struggle to balance the strict old-world ways of their parents with a desire to fit into a more liberal society. On June 16th, the father and brother of a slain teen were sentenced to life in prison after pleading guilty to the 2007 December murder of Aksa Parvez, a 16-year-old girl of Pakistani descent who wanted to wear Western clothes and get a part-time job like her Canadian peers. Days ago, an Afghan mother was arrested in Montreal, accused of stabbing her 19-year-old daughter after she stayed out all night in a case that's now being probed as a possible honor crime. Dr. Amin Muhammad is a psychiatrist at Memorial University in St. John's, who is currently working on a report for the federal government about honor killings in Canada. He says there have been 13 such cases in the country since 2002. Quote, We're seeing an upward trend. More cases are coming to the forefront in the legal system. Unquote. Noting honor killings are not in any way condoned in the Quran, he suggested the idea is coming up more as a defense for murder by people hoping to take advantage of Canada's cultural sensitivity in order to receive a more lenient sentence. He also said he suspects mental health issues are behind most cases. Quote, we cannot rule out personality disorder among the perpetrators or some sort of psychopathy. I think all such cases should be evaluated from a mental health perspective. Unquote. A report Mohammed published two years ago found that a number of countries actually allow for partial or full defense against criminal charges on the basis of honor killing, including Argentina, Bangladesh, Ecuador, Guatemala, Turkey, Jordan, Syria, Lebanon, Iran, Israel, and the Palestinian Authority, Venezuela, Peru, and Egypt. While many recent cases in Western society involve Muslims, Mohammed said honor killings have also been committed in the name of Hinduism, Sikhism, and Christianity. Those of you who know my position on banning the burqa will know that I come down heavily on the side of a secular state, intervening in the private sphere when a group has so little power that the state needs to come in to the equation to balance out the scales. This is certainly one of those times. Honor-based violence and killing is not a problem you can solve by passing a law. If the government waits until a law has been broken to do something, that means a girl or a woman has already been victimized or perhaps murdered. This requires an aggressive anti-honor violence education campaign in all schools, public or private, secular or religious. 
It requires a counter-narrative about the dishonorable nature of honor killings, and that being someone who killed a family member is far worse than anything a girl or a woman could do. It requires an active, involved, culturally sensitive engagement with the youth to undo the years of family and social pressures. But someone else's so-called honor is not the only reason women are murdered by the men they know. In the United States, men gun down women by the hundreds every single year. As gun safety groups participated in National Gun Violence Awareness Day on June 2nd, they've noted that more than half of the partner-to-partner -partner killings in the last few years were with a gun. These incidents often spill out into the public and are a driving motive behind mass shootings across the country. Allison Anderman, managing attorney at the Law Center to Prevent Gun Violence, said, we Americans think that we are safer in the United States from violence, terrorism, and other dangers. But I wonder if American women know that we are 16 times more likely to be shot and killed than our counterparts in other countries." Unquote. Domestic violence charges are often talked down to a misdemeanor offense, or the charges are dropped if a witness doesn't speak. People convicted of any domestic violence charges are federally banned from owning a gun, but 35 states don't have a full ban on misdemeanor offenses, according to gun control groups. Cities in states that ban domestic violence offenders from buying or possessing a gun have a 25% lower partner-to-partner -partner homicide rate than states that don't. A 2013 essay by professors April M. Zioli and Shannon Frateroli found some 18% of shooting suspects with at least four victims have previously been accused of domestic violence. Domestic violence is made much more deadly by firearms, said Anderman. Here is another tragic example of women and gun violence. Seattle police have released audio of the police shooting that ended with Charlena Lilas dead in front of her children. The audio, linked to dashboard cameras in the two patrol cars responding to the initial call, is redacted in certain areas, according to the Seattle Times. The officers can be heard discussing Lilas's previous calls to the police and her mental health issues. One officer says that she began, quote, talking all crazy about how the officers weren't going to leave, while another asks if she had a mental precaution on her. The officer responds that she has an officer safety precaution on file. The recording reveals that officers were aware of Lilas's mental health issues and the fact that the children might be in the home before they opened fire in the apartment. One officer asks, wait, is this the one with like the three kids? Yeah, the other officer responds. Yeah, so this gal is the one who is making all the inaudible statements about how her and her daughters were gonna turn into wolves. What can you even say to the murder of a pregnant woman in front of her children? This woman was mentally ill. They knew she was mentally ill, and they still shot her dead. There are so many people to blame in this situation. The officers who murdered her, the Republicans at the federal level who won't fund mental health services so people like this woman can be treated, and the Seattle Social Services for not doing more to check in on her and her children. And let's not beat around the bush. Charlena was a black woman, and black women in the United States are far more likely to be shot by a man than white women are. This article reports, using data provided by the FBI, a report by the Violence Policy Center, an organization that conducts research on American violence, analyzed every instance in which a lone man killed a woman in 2014. During that year, black women were murdered at more than twice the rate of white women. Of black victims who knew their killers, 57% were killed by an intimate partner. In more than half of the cases where the weapon could be identified, black women were killed with a firearm, according to this report. This is why intersectional feminism is absolutely necessary, so that you can see these patterns and understand how people are affected differently. And the final story I want to cover this week is also intersectional in nature, the systematic murder of trans women of color in the United States. Last week, the 14th trans woman of color was murdered this year. That's since January. And this report came out in June. Barely even a woman yet at 17 years old, Ava LeRae Barron is the 14th trans woman of color in the United States whose life was ended too early. Police reports indicate that she was shot in the chest on Sunday morning following an altercation with someone she knew who has currently been charged with murder and aggravated assault. The author goes on to write, 
It seems as though a trans woman is murdered every three weeks in the United States, and it has got to stop. What's the most disgusting to me, however, is that every single one of these slain women have been women of color. We've lost 12 black trans women this year, one native trans woman, and one Latina trans woman. Racism is tied into these deaths, just like it's tied into the fabric of our country. And these are just the women we know of. How many more have been killed this year by state violence like poverty or the prison industrial complex? How many more have been misgendered by family and authorities and whose lives we will never get to mourn? The author concludes, we need to work harder for our sisters when they're alive. We need to ally ourselves with them in ways that we haven't been doing so that we aren't constantly writing eulogies. I'm going to end this video in a slightly different way this week. I'll say now that I've been Christy, and you've been awesome for staying with me through these difficult stories all the way through to the end of the episode. Let's keep the focus on the victims. 14 is just a number, but these girls and women were people with families and friends who loved them. This week, the end of the video is for them. Watching through windows, you're wondering if I'm okay. Secret stolen from deep inside. The drum beats out of time. If you lost, you can look and you will find me. Time after time. If you fall, I will catch you, I'll be waiting Time after time If you lost, you can look and you will find me Time after time If you fall, I will catch you, I will be waiting Time after time 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 When you said go slow Fall behind Second hand unwinds If you lost you can look and you will find me Time after time If you fall, I will catch you I'll be waiting Time after time Time after time Time after time Time after time Time after time